Peter now probably doesn't need any introduction. He is a food hacker extraordinaire from what I hear. He is also the director of Open Query and MySQL support business. So please welcome Arjen Lentz. Good crowd, I like speaking to LCAs. The rooms are big and you get more people. That's, that's excellent. Um, apparently I used up some credit getting this item into the program um, because um, unless I talk about the actual code behind it, um, it wouldn't necessarily be an LCA talk. So I will indulge later on and, uh, and explain how, how I did it. And yes, you're welcome to look at the code. It's out there, GPL, of course. Um, so, yes, my name is Arjen. I run a company called Open Query. It's based here in Brisbane, so welcome to my hometown if you're from elsewhere. And years and years ago, I was working on a web project and I was just mucking around in, in MySQL and PHP and I never actually finished that project. It never happened. Um, I was my, browsing the MySQL website because of it, and that's how I got my job with MySQL. So it, the, some benefit came out of that project. Another sideline was that I hadn't solved that niggly problem yet. And the problem was that I was dealing with hierarchies in MySQL menu trees to be exact. Uh, to be exact. And um, it just wasn't working the way I liked it and I was looking for a better way. And a couple of years later I worked it out, how to do it conceptually. And there was no way to make that work at that point in MySQL. And later on, the director of architecture, Brian Aker, told me um, it couldn't really be done the way I was thinking it could be done. Um, I proved him wrong and he was very happy with that. Um, he's good like that. We're, we're good friends. Um, so anyway, it, it took a long time and essentially it took about six years to, um, to develop. And by the time I actually implemented it, I had long left MySQL, the company that is. So what we have now is a graph engine. So you may be aware that MySQL supports multiple engines. There's different bits of code that can be used to store data. Some store information in memory only, some store things on disk, some store things on multiple disks. You probably owe someone a round of something now with phones blipping. Um, and there's also other differences in terms of locking transactions, lots of different attributes of the architecture. And each of these engines is suitable for different purposes. For instance, my ISOM engine was originally built for data warehousing. So it's not only good at lots of concurrent select, but also at very high speed inserts, particularly bulk inserts. That is what it's good at, but from a single, a single thread primarily. Multiple threads will tend to slow it down because of the right concurrency um, implementation in there. InnoDB is very good at transactional operations and that will be what most implementations or what most production implementations use. So the graph engine or OQ graph for short um, does something like that except it doesn't store regular data and now we'll look at where it came from and what it does and how it does it with some, uh, some funky demos along the way. So the things we're trying to deal with are hierarchies the usual things could be menu trees, but it could be it could be some complex scientific data as well that that happens to be a hierarchy. So think very broadly. This is just to give you an idea. Um, but typically menu structures, but also organizational trees, simple organizations, not matrix organizations, of course. So Dilbert reports to the pointy haired boss. He probably doesn't want to, but anyway. Um, the other things we're dealing with are graphs. From my perspective, they're more interesting and. A tree is essentially a simplified graph anyway, so it's kind of the same thing. Um, that's become rather more important in, in more recent years because of the social networking thing. It is, it is fairly useful on a website or for lots of other projects if you can actually connect people and things to each other. And, um, and many websites at the moment are avoiding this because most of them run on a relational database, but even if you don't, you would need to implement something yourself or procedurally deal with it. And it either becomes very slow or a lot of work. Let's put it that way. And this might actually be a solution. And I have a demo of that later. So the typical, the typical question that you might want to ask in a network or a tree is who reports to the pointy haired boss? And then you get the list of, of employees. So who reports directly? Or how many people report directly or indirectly? And then you get a subtree. Or what is the path from this point to the root entry. So that's a whole chain. Um, so from me, how many steps between me and the CEO? 
well, in my company that's about zero, but anyway, you get the idea. Um, and of course, you can play the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Now, I have to admit, um, I could probably run the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I've, I've got the, the filters on the, um, the movie database data set to actually make this work. However, I don't have enough RAM in my machine at home to make this work. Eight gig was not enough. Um, just because I need to keep, the current implementation wants to keep all that data in memory. And um, I can't keep the entire graph in RAM the way it's currently implemented. So I need more than eight gig. I got a fair way. I did import as much as I could and then did some queries. And in some cases, you couldn't find a connection. In some cases, it did. Maybe longer than it would otherwise have been. Um, so yes, it, it can work. It's about four, what was it, like 45 million um, connections. If you, if you strip out DVDs and stuff, if you stay purely with, like only DVDs, if you stay purely with movies and, and strip out some other nonsense. Um, but also, what's the shortest path from A to B? Um, so essentially, you can re-implement, well, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. And I'm not for a second, by the way, suggesting that you should be trying to clone Facebook, because that's been done, um, both by Facebook as well as by others. Um, but websites can benefit from social networking uh, facilities, and there's plenty of, of ways to interact with the social network of people. Um, you can, you can access people's Twitter, um, Twitter information um, and connect through there. For instance, you can actually use the Facebook API to get some information out of there. In any case, there's plenty of ways by which people would be able to connect to their friends on your website without them having to re-enter their whole social graph. It is out there already. It is accessible. Okay, so how do you deal with that in SQL? It doesn't fit particularly well. There's the adjacency model which either does a fixed maximum, a fixed maximum depth, I think you need to do joins, left joins or subqueries, and you kind of code it that way. So you have a maximum depth that you're dealing with, or you need to deal with recursive queries. So you're essentially procedurally dealing with it. Not particularly nice. It can be fairly fast, but it's just not very pretty code. Oracle has connect by prior, and that's just an Oracleism. And various other servers have, have different things that do similar similar functionality. SQL 99 has a recursive union. I despise the syntax that it uses, but the people who are used to it love it, and that's perfectly fine. Postgres supports the recursive union, so it can do some of these things out of the box, absolutely no problem at all, okay? Then there's nested sets. Their architecture a little bit more complex, um, but you can do a lot more nice tricky. You can very easily find an entire subtree. That is, that is one of those very, very easy queries with nested sets. I won't go into the details of how that's implemented. Um, but basically, inserting entries takes a little bit more work. It might require some shuffling in, the, uh, in IDs and, and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing is, it cannot deal with any graph. It has to be a plain tree. So if any, entries, if any entry has two parents, it doesn't work. You can use a materialized path. And the simple description of that is um, 1 slash 3 slash 4 slash 10. And essentially, you, you write out the path and use it as a string. Um, and that is actually remarkably functional. It seems a bit stupid, but it works. And one implementation that you may have seen in the wild um, is in Easy Publish, a Norwegian um, well, enterprise CMS uh, uses that. And it actually works remarkably well. But again, it can't really deal with multiple parents without, uh, without other hacks. Graphs, you just have to handle programmatically. As in, you look at an entry and you see which other parents it has or which other links it has, and you just walk through it, backtrack, and, and so on. So you need to just work through that. You could put that in a stored procedure. That works as well, but it doesn't necessarily make it faster or nicer to handle. So what is OQ graph then? It's um, Something, as I mentioned, that developed by me in concept. I hacked around in the middle of the night and, and various other bits of time um, to get the basics going. And then I needed someone smarter to actually plug it in properly into the MySQL server. So the person sitting next to me there is Anthony Curtis. He's been hacking on storage engine for over 10 years. He's probably written more than any of us. And um, he's very good at that time kind of thing. So it is a storage engine. It doesn't modify anything in the server itself. 
So we haven't mucked around with the optimizer. We just tell it a few lies to make it do what we want. Um, but that's what all engines do, essentially. They just tell, you just tell it what you want to do. And we haven't changed SQL syntax or added to it. That, that's not necessary. And that was very important to us. Um, because initially, we had no idea how this was going to get, if it was going to get integrated into MySQL, and if so, how. And the less intrusive you are, the more chance you have, of course. If it's a clean plug-in from a certain angle, then there's a higher chance if you're not interfering with the, the other versions or uh, all the other stuff going on. OK, now, so it's technically an engine. However, it's not actually storing regular data. The only thing we're storing is essentially node IDs or the ID of a person and the link between them. So we have an originating node and a destination node and an optional weight. That's all. The rest of a person's data or whatever data you attach it to would be in other tables. But heck, that's what the relational database is for. You have other tables and you can join on them. Okay? So the name that Anthony Curtis came up with is it's a computational engine. We stick some data, we stick bits of information in, and it computes whatever we want. In this case, for instance, the shortest path or a related, um, a related type of query. OK, does that make sense so far? So it looks like a table from the user perspective. And technically, it is relational. We, we query it, and out comes a table. We juggle around with, with the sets and re return a set as well. So that makes it relational. But what you get returned is not a subset of the rows that you put in. It is based on the rows you put in, but it will look a little bit different. You'll get to that in a moment. Okay? So there's a data set that you put in, and you can get it back in a clean way. You can retrieve the data set for a dump. But once you start making that, that uh, engine do tasks, your result set does not have much resemblance to the actual table inside, because inside, of course, it's a graph and not a table. So the specified number of rows that you put in, you don't get back a subset, so you may get back a funny, a funny number. Um, the table that you're working with actually has more columns than you are able to put data into. There are some that have a special function. We'll look at that in a moment. And the indexes that the table structure has are a lie. They don't actually exist. We just need to tell the optimizer that they exist, otherwise it makes the wrong choices, and you'll see why in a moment. So you can kind of see it as a magic view. We just need to make sure that the environment does the right thing for us. How would you install it? For MySQL 5, it's a bit of a pest because we do need to hack things into the server. For MySQL version 5, you can't just add a new storage engine. You need to change the parser for it. So you need to plug into the parser, add some, add some uh, Lex keywords, and then put it into Bison in the... In the, in the um, in the grammar of the, the SQL language and so on. So it needs to be put into various bits. It is a fairly simple patch, but depending on which version of MySQL you're dealing with, you need to modify the patch. So what we've done is put it in the our, our Delta enhanced um, builds. So that's where it's available. If you're still using MySQL 5, this would be one place to get it. You just replace your binary with this binary or package. There are Debian and Ubuntu and, and Red Hat uh, CentOS packages, and that just works. And you can see whether you have that particular engine by doing show global variables like have uh, OQ graph, and that, that will be set to true. That's one of those little patches that we put in. That's the normal way of doing it in version 5. So that's the, that's the quick hack. Um, current production version of MySQL, um, depending on what you're using, is 5.1. It could also be 5.5 from, from Oracle now. And um, if you're using MariaDB, it would be 5.2. Now, the really cool thing is, at least from my perspective, that MariaDB 5.2 has OQGraph built in. And that's just really, really nice. The problem with plugins from 5.1 and above is, yes, they're plugins. You could build whatever you're plugging in separately and then just say install plugin and so on. However, you need to get a number of compiler switches exactly right that it matches up with what the main build was. And to make it even more fun, there's no versioning of the API. So if you don't compile it against the exact same version of the source code that MySQL used for that particular build, and yes, you can find, you can find out, things may blow up, or they may not. Anyway, it, it, fun things will happen. Um, I know from other people writing engines that this is a complete pest. So 
So I would really, really discourage this. And that's why I'm really, really happy that it's just built into MariaDB. It's not compiled into the binary. What has happened is that it gets built in the same build environment and ends up as a shared library in the tree and gets installed. And then you still need to run that install line to make sure the library gets loaded by the server. So if you just install MariaDB, OQGraph will not be loaded, will not take up any memory or do anything. And then when you load it, it is available and you could use it to, um, to, to deal with graph tables. You can see whether it's installed by doing show plugins and it will be listed in there and show storage engines because it is a show storage engine plugin. For Drizzle, a port has been done. We haven't actually worked on it because they've been modifying the API so much. I want to wait until it settles a bit. Um, and then hopefully someone else will uh, pay me for um, cleaning it up again. I just don't have the time for it right now. But the original port was done by someone else without telling us beforehand. So quite likely someone else will do this again and it will just happen. But they're probably waiting for it to settle to not have to do it every weekend. What does a table look like? It always looks like this. Okay, so that may appear a bit, a bit funny, but like I said, we're not dealing with a regular table, we're not dealing with regular data, we're dealing purely with the graph data, all the other data would be in a separate table. And in fact, that separate table will probably also have that link information, but you would copy that across to this graph table, maybe, maybe via triggers, maybe periodically, it depends a bit on how often that information would get updated. So, um, I think the next page explains kind of what it does. But just briefly to go back, um, whoever latch will, we'll get back to that in a moment. Origa D, Desta D, and Wait are the ones you actually put data in. SEQ and Link ID are other output variables that we'll deal with in a moment. Those two um, indexes make sure that MySQL will never attempt a table scan to resolve a query. If it were to try doing a table scan, it would get back to the original table information rather than what we're trying to compute. It needs to actually address the different functions in the API that do um, primary key lookups, direct lookups, and for that you need to pretend to have hash table, uh, hash index, and that's what we have, or at least pretend to have. It's, it's quirky, isn't it? Um, that's what you get when you talk to Anthony Curtis. He, he can do things with the optimizer without telling the optimizer. It's really, really good. So you have a rig ID, dest ID. That's a link between the two. It's directional. You're always creating a directional graph. At the moment, if you want a two-directional link, you just insert the same but opposite as well. So you're doubling the number of, of links that you have if everything is, is um, bidirectional. There's an optional weight. The default is one. Maybe the default should be zero. I'm happy to debate that one. Um, at the moment, it's, it's one. None of the other columns actually exist. We're not storing them. We're just using them for input and output um, purposes. And we'll get back to that. Um, so to insert something, this is an example. Okay, we're inserting into foo, our typical demo table, uh, rig ID and ID. we don't care about the other columns because they don't exist anyway, and the default weight will be one, 1, 2, 2,3, and so on. So we create a tiny little tree of, um, well, items, people, whatever their IDs might be. We can select that back. By the way, I could do a live demo, but it does not serve a particular purpose. I've just cut and pasted this earlier. Um, so when you select that, that's the information you get back. Now you already see there is some extra information that is in there. SEQ starts counting for you. It's a sequence, like an ordering. So normally in relational, day, in relational um, structures, row, rows have no order. So unless you use an order by, you have no control over the order in which the rows come back. So if you don't use order by, they may come back in any order. Now. If you use order by, then you have to order by something that is already in that row. Otherwise, you can't decide. So usually, it's someone's name or an ID or something. You'll see later in the results that we really need to know in which order entries come because those are the steps from A to B. Therefore, we stick in the sequence. Then you, have, then you can order by ACQ and all will be well. So we need to provide our own ordering so that you might use it. Okay? Latch is null because we're not doing anything with it there, and link ID equals null as well. And the weight is one as we, well, we didn't specify it, and it ended up to default. Now we're going to do magic. All right, still with me? We are setting latch to one, and then we're saying, I want to find the shortest path, and latch equals one says that. I'll explain that in a moment. Origa ID equals one, destination ID equals six. And you see in the output, latch equals one, origa ID equals 
um, one, and there's Tadi equals six. So we're relationally still kind of correct. Yeah? Based on the query, you get the output. The fact that the table itself in the storage didn't actually have latch equals one anywhere stored, and we didn't filter it that way to get it back, sideline. Yeah? Applications don't care about that. MySQL doesn't care about that at, at that higher level, or the optimizer. Um, so we can kind of fudge, uh, fudge around with that. Um, then you might see the steps. Let's see if I have a, cur a cursor there. That's good. I don't need a laser pointer. Um, so those are the steps. Step zero is the originating step. Then it's step one, step two, step three. Okay? Now, how do we actually take the steps? Here are the actual steps. Yeah, so we start at item one. We walk to item two, item three, and item six. That is our path. Okay? We can clean it up a bit. There's a nice function called group concat for MySQL version 4.1 and up. And inside, and, and we can use that to essentially create a little bit of a pivot. So we can turn the column link ID into a single column and then concatenate it with whatever item, uh, whatever string we want. It defaults to a comma. And we can apply an order by. We order by execute, of course, otherwise our path will go funny. And so we get a path from one, two, three, six. You could also insert arrows. We'll do that later, just for fun. Um, but this, this shows you a quick a path thing. Now, the reason I named it latch is who, who, who here also does um, electronics? Some of you. You will be familiar with latches. You control microchips with that, and you can tell the chip what to do with certain registers based on what values in there. That's exactly what we're doing. That is precisely what we're doing. So latch equals one tells the engine to do computations based on Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. That's it. If latch is null, then it will deliver back the original table. That's the idea. So we can add in an infinite number, well, limited by the, by the, by the width of that field, of course, of, uh, of values. We're probably going to make that an enum, so you could address it via the number or a name. That, that's um, probably nicer. Uh, the problem is people are already using this, so we need to be a little bit careful on how we hack it. But we can turn it into an enum, and you can still use the numbers anyway. Other searches you could do. Um, if you don't specify an originating ID, it finds all paths to the destination ID. So from, which I, from where could I get to node 4? Not from everywhere, because they're one-way paths. Okay? So you can't get from item 6 to item 4. That doesn't work. But you can get from item 1 to item 4. So from 1, 2, and 4, you can arrive at 4. Where can I get to from item 4? Well, you can get to 4, 5, and 6. I didn't return them in any particular order, so it comes out as 6, 5, 4 in this particular case. By the way, if you like a copy of these slides, that's perfectly fine too. I see some people making notes. That's, that's cool, but the slides are, uh, are public. Um, so this is the basic mathematical background of, of it and how fast it would be. Makes sense for more, makes more sense for some people than for others. I tend to not care about those things. Um, pragmatist here. Um, SQL update and delete is also possible. However, don't modify the path you're traversing because Dijkstra's, of course, needs to backtrack once in a while and you could find yourself lost in the wilderness. Um, and the engine has no way of knowing or caring and the amount of code we would need to spend on making it care is not worthwhile. So, um, yeah, you don't change the path while you're walking it. You could retrieve it, stick it in the temporary table, and then modify it in a separate query in some way. Um, but know what you're getting yourself into. Modifying your table while you're walking it, not safe. In that sense, it's, of course, different from a regular table. If you modify a regular table, you only look at each row once. In this case, you're not dealing with a regular table, but with magic. Now, how to make this information pretty? How do we actually tack it onto real-world information that you want to output rather than the numbers? So we insert some, some stuff from MASH into another table, and then we do a join. Does this make sense for everybody? Yeah, we just join it onto a second table. So we have a path from Pierce to Mock -Hay. Or you can use some RDF data. Why not? And this was one of the simplest yet fun reasonably sized data sets. It's about 89,000, um, somewhere between 89 and 92,000 um, entries. It's a tree. We want to walk it in any direction, so I insert it twice with reverse uh, links, so you end up with 178,000 edges. Okay? So we insert that twice. Um, 
the information for this is all it's all available. So toll um, tollweb.org has the basic data set. Uh, what we have got is a little um, a little XSL to to mangle that into something that we can use, and then we we insert that. So all the transformation stuff is is available, and we uh, well we create toll with XSL which we import. So what do we can what can we do now? Where is Homo sapiens? Where do we reside in the tree of life? So tree of, uh, toll web um, essentially is, a, is one of the implementations of or one of the projects on the web for looking at all life on Earth and seeing how it connects. Not all branches or, or let's say intersections in the tree are named. I'll mention that now. So this path is actually 76 steps, but not all the steps are named. And I made the, in the import. Um, in the import process, I made those fields null. Because we're using a group by function, that's group concat, it will leave out the nulls. Very convenient. Magic. Okay, so yeah, we go from life on Earth and we go into the, um, into the animals and so on. Vertebrates, mammalia, hominids, and then you end up with homo sapiens. It does work out. So it's a path from the root entry down, down the tree. You could do this via other programmatic means or other structures. This is all still doable. After all, it's a tree. But we're going to do more funky stuff. That takes a little bit more effort. You really, really want to know now how we relate to bananas. Okay. By the way, all of this only applies if the Earth is, less, is more than 6,000 years old. Otherwise, all, all bets are off on this one. <laughs> yep. Um, okay. How do we get from Homo sapiens to, to that family of banana trees? I, I used Wikipedia for this, by the way. Um, you go all the way up to the unicorns, and then, then you go the other path and end up at, uh, at the, in the tree department. So that kind of works. If you've gone up the tree and down the tree now, kind of pretending it's a graph. So that seems to work. That's OK. Um, again, there's more steps than this, but it just comes back in, I don't know, a couple of hundreds of a second on my, on my laptop. There's no particular sense in, in measuring that. It's just a very fast query. Now we've dealt with bananas. Let's do something else. Um, the thing to do in programs, of course, you want to build a maze and then traverse it. And we can now do this in SQL. Does this have any use whatsoever? Of course it doesn't. This is pure nonsense. Um, but it works. And yes, the code is available. You can build your own mazes over millions by millions of things and try to solve them on your SQL uh, in your database. It's, it's, it's fun nonsense. So a very simple example. Um, this is a 5 by 5 And um, it finds a path from there to walk around and so on. Um, so I call this the extra mouse. Um, this is too simple, so we do a thousand. Oh, hang on, yeah. Um, I've done a thousand by a thousand. Um, it didn't want to load before I stuffed something up in my um, in my loader routine on this machine. Um, so I'll just have to tell you. Um, I made a thousand by a thousand maze, dumped it into an SQL file, so it then can load that. It has a couple of million, um, what does that do? So that creates a million rooms, uh, thousand by thousand equals a million, which means you have two point something million doors between the rooms, which means that you have double that number in actual paths because you can walk that door in both directions. Um, and when you actually traverse the path, you have something in the order of 100 something thousand steps to get from A to B, usually. It depends a bit because, of course, it creates a random path when you, when you generate. Um, it still comes back in under a second. Yeah, point, point 0.7 or point 0.8 of a second on this 2 gigahertz dual core. Um, and for a single query, MySQL only uses a single core, so it, it can do that kind of query. To actually take those 100,000 steps or report those 100,000 steps back to you, of course, it's looked at many more rooms. I'd have to add on some debugging to figure out how many it has, and again, it's dependent on the maze. But it's looked at hundreds of thousands of rooms, maybe most of the rooms in a million even, and then worked out which hundred thousand are there, and it still comes back in less than a second. So again, it's absolutely useless and senseless to play with mazes in SQL. It makes no sense whatsoever, but it proves the point that you can have a fairly large data set and look at it effic fairly efficiently and get some a decent result that you can then use in your application, and that was the uh, that was the point. You can use a query like this to actually make it make it look good in the in the output. Um, the in, on input, I linearize the the um, the x and the y coordinates of the of the rooms, and then on output, I rip it apart again. 
So a bit of basic math. How much memory does it use and how does the engine behave? It uses 60 bytes per edge, about. Um, and we use the boost graph library internally. So we haven't actually re-implemented all those graph algorithms. We just use what the, what the boost graph library delivers. Now, having said that, we're probably going to rip that out again because we're thoroughly fed up with C++ templates. They're not really, really shiny. I despise C++ already, so yeah, not good. I can't even add new algorithms. Now I get completely lost. I need Anthony's not just help, I need hand-holding. Um, virtual hand-holding, he's in Los Angeles, but still. Um, it, it does not make me happy, and if I'm having trouble doing this and I understand how the thing works, other people are not going to add algorithms, and that's a very serious problem. Because at the moment we're not getting contributions to this, even though people are interested. The infrastructure is just too complicated. So if any of you are C++ and template capable, please help me while we are still in template land. Uh, because ripping out the entire back end of the engine and, and using another library. We have found another little C library that does this stuff. Um, yeah, while that hasn't happened yet, we do need to, uh, we do need to deal with those issues. Um, I think... Could someone grab the power supply from the bottom of my pack, please? And yeah, somewhere in the bottom, rolled up. Um, just in case, I think I should have enough power. Eh, you never know. Um, so, there's a plug there. And, yep. Okay. Um, so, it behaves like a memory engine. It does not use the memory engine. I want to make that absolutely clear. Someone got into, uh, into confusions about that. Yep, that seems to work. Thank you. Um, it uses table level locking, which means that whatever operation someone does, if it's a write, everybody else will have to wait. If it's a read, other people can read the table or run a, uh, run a search, but writers will have to wait. So that's the basic, the basic locking strategy at this point. You have to remember it's all in memory, so it's really, really fast anyway. It doesn't matter that you have that kind of locking in this particular case. There's no persistence. That is, if you restart your server, the table will still exist, but it will be empty because it is all in memory. As I mentioned before, you probably have the structure of the links in another table, and you copy that in. You can copy that in on startup, and there's ways to do that. There's a function, uh, there's an, a configuration option called init file, and if you specify that init file, it will be read on startup and execute SQL queries from there. So you can actually say um, insert into a certain table, select from a couple of columns from another table. Yes, Lindsay. It just works. You could, um, oh, you think, you're saying if you restart one server and it happens to be the master, okay. So the question is, how does it work with replication? It would also replicate, and yes, it would cause trouble if you're not needing to initialize a slave. You could, uh, if you install this on all items in the environment, including the slaves, so they all initialize themselves, then there's a statement for a thread, you can actually disable binary logging. Uh, SQL log bin equals zero, set, set session SQL log bin equals zero, um, then run this stuff and then turn it on again. That would, that would solve that problem, um, does the trick. That is, I think, the quickest way at this point to deal with it. Of course, we would like a persistent version, but that just would take more development time. We want more people using it. Um, there are some people using it, but we'd like more people using it. And then it's only actually required for bigger data sets because reloading this kind of stuff up to a couple of million entries is not really a problem. So, and you, again, you duplicate the data anyway. You can also use triggers um, for inserts, updates, and deletes to when, when you change your original data to update this file. That will not make it persistent, but you can combine the two to reload your data as well as keeping it up to date. So that can work, okay? It doesn't have transactions either. So if you combine the graph engine in a transaction with something else, an insert will not be consistent between the two engines. They can't, uh, they can't synchronize like that. Okay, those are the links for the source code and so on. What I'll do now is give you a practical example of how to actually use this stuff. Welcome to Friendface, yay. <laughs> no, I don't watch the IT crowd, but um, there's people around me who do. Um, the, th this is Drupal. Um, is this readable? Is it a bit small? I might make it a bit bigger. There we go. Does that work? Yeah. Hang on. It walks off the end of the screen. I might make it smaller again. Sorry. You'll have to squint a little bit. Um, so 
the original, the, there's, an, there's a friend list module inside Drupal. So you can just install that. There is a module for that. What we added is a friend list graph module, which was implemented early last year by my good friend and colleague, uh, Peter Lieverding, Cafuego on IRC. And he implemented that in about, I don't know, an hour total. That's what made this thing work. And earlier, early this week, he took my machine and built this website. Okay, so that's how quickly this goes, and he took about an hour on that. Um, so we essentially cloned Facebook within two hours in Drupal. Not a problem. Okay, now, but seriously, you can't do this kind of stuff without this engine. So just just to give you an example, um, we put in just for the heck of it, 250,000 users, and we gave each user I think three random connections. And of course, other people will link back to the same person, so each person will have more than three connections by now. So, can someone give me a number between one and 250,000? Number 42, must have the number 42. By the way, I'm turning 42 next month. Yeah. <laughs> yes. you, would, you would know this because two years ago I lost my hair for turning 40, so that's, yeah, that was two years ago. So, other number? 1,000, three? 337. I can certainly do that. Absolutely. Why not? Find a relationship. Okay, we've got that. And you saw how long that query took. Not very long at all. What have we done? We've done three shortest path queries. The first is how does this user, and yes, they're, they're random, randomly um, created um, usernames, how does this user connect to that user? Well, via that path. Yeah? There's slightly more than six degrees of separation, but you get the idea. If you do this in a real social network, you would get your six degrees usually if you have a fairly decently connected one. So this one is actually doing more work than you would have to. Most people have more than four connections is the point. We're also doing the six degrees of Linus, one must. And so from A to Linus and then from Linus to B. So the total is three queries. You saw the time that it took. We can grab some other numbers. Yeah, no, that's a bit too much. Okay. We can load that, and that's the result. Okay? Works, doesn't it? Um, so people can now have friends, uh, but they can also have fans. So fan is a one-way connection, and that's just what, something that friendly support. Friend, friend is, um, is a two-way connection. What can you do with this? Well, when you look up, let's go to the home page, there's some random blog entries that we're really interested in. I have no idea what this means. It, Oh, actually, it means nothing. It's fake Latin. But um, so this blog entry has an author right there. On the right-hand side, there's now a block, which is essentially a custom query, a view inside um, Drupal, with a couple of um, a couple of clicks. We create that kind of stuff, and we now can tell how I relate to that particular author in um, on this website. So that's one query that is just now possible to do. And you can do that with any content on the site. Okay, that's about it for demos and good fun. I'll take questions. And I have one minute for the questions? Or five minutes? Two questions, so we have five minutes. Excellent, that sounds good. Um, so what if there are two shortest paths which are the same length? Does one of them get returned? Can you get both returned? And can you find all the paths between two points? Yes. Um, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, no. Uh, at the moment, you will get a shortest path. You don't get, th well, which may be the or a. Okay, it, if there's multiple, you don't know which one you're getting because essentially it doesn't matter that much. You can't at the moment get all. Um, we've looked at this and we need to do something quirky in the result sets to, to do this or add an extra column or some extra, yeah, I don't necessarily want to add more columns. It makes it, because there's always more algorithms that require more of this stuff and I want to keep this simple. Yes, we don't want to fix the SR columns, one for each algorithm, but we can always overload, and, and there's lots of, lots of tricks about it. There is a way uh, in MySQL to return multiple result sets. It, that's already available, because if you do straight select statements in a store procedure that you don't store anywhere, they get tossed back at the client. So there's an API for that from version 5.0 and up. Now, if you were to do that from the engine, that's entirely doable, you, you can specify there's more result sets coming, and then each of the result sets would be a path. 
that's entirely doable. However, the current infrastructure inside the engine doesn't support this. So Anthony knows how to do it, and this was his suggestion. We don't actually necessarily want to do it. So, I mean, yes, it's a valid question, but unless you have a really, I need this now, yeah, better not. Next question. Um, given that RDF is a three hypergraph, and in fact most implementations use a four or occasionally even a five hypergraph, how do you, how are you encoding that in your standard bi uh, biograph um, implementation that you have that you that you demonstrated here? Well, what you see is what you get. So it is quite possible that some some forms of F RDF data are not easily or not at all representable so inside my system, so or you'd have to do something smart. So that tree of life was a had only one predicate. No, is that correct? I think or? so. Right. Okay. We could we could look at that, but yeah, it it can get. Um, I mean, if the result is something that looks like a graph, it is mappable, but you may need to do quite a bit of transformation to make it so. I mean, the RDF data needs to run through your XSL uh, uh, star sheets and some other magic to to make this work. So, I, I think it's doable. For most, for most graphs, but there might be a lot of work involved in actually making it so. But the, once you have those transformations for a data set, they're repeatable. Okay. Actually, re return question, because you're, you're the RDF expert. Um, I mean, in the end, it's all a graph, isn't it? So I am I correct in, in presuming that, apart from the transformations, there are no intrinsic problems to mapping it? Well, the intrinsic problem here is that RDF, well, technically a graph isn't a graph in the traditional node, node, and a direct and a direct vertice. In fact, it's a each edge in the graph has three vertices in it. And um, in most RDF implementations, they actually put a f shove a fourth one in there because it turns out that for all practical purposes, if you want to implement anything, three isn't enough. Um, and so, yeah, it isn't actually representable in any sane way as yeah. a standard biograph. Okay, in, in that case, the conclusion is you'd have to do extra trickery. We've had this question from a potential client who essentially needed to attach extra attributes to a, ver a vertex, to a, connect, to a link, and the answer at the moment is no, we can't. They, would, they actually needed to do fairly complex computations on a link to work out which one was more interesting than another. That's not something we do um, right now. It's, def it's definitely possible, and you could hook in all kinds of trickery, but it's not something that's done right now. There's no technical limitation on, on getting it done. So if it needs to be done, it can be added in. Um, I'm just a bit hesitant in, in feature bloating the, the basic idea, because it's already very useful for lots of purposes. It may not be. It may not be beneficial for all RDFs, but heck, there's RDF data stores and you wrote one yourself. So uh, <laughs> let's please use those things. I also, uh, before the next question, I should mention, there are perfectly good um, graph databases. One is Neo4j, which seems to be fairly popular. Um, and there, there are others, and they have different types of licensing. That, that's all fine. The thing is, many or most of us already have most of our data set inside MySQL. So what I've seen in the wild is people have an, a, a MySQL data set, then grab out part of the graph, put it in Neo4j, do their complex um, graph searches, grab out the result, put it back in MySQL, join it onto other data, and then display it. Now, given that scenario, here's a more convenient version of the same thing. The actual speed of the search will usually be the same until you get to extremely large graphs, in which case we run out of memory and they don't. Next question, last question? Or? Um. One more, okay. Yeah, anyway, that was kind of my question was, are, are you able to tag the relationship somehow so that you can say, you know, yes, I'm related to my children and I'm related to my parents, but that's a different type of relationship. I would do that via weight. That's how I would encode it. For instance, on this friend face thing, I would encode it via weight, and then some are more weight higher than others in a search. I don't know whether that's really the suitable way. It is. The weight is a float, so you can do it in fractions, so it doesn't actually matter that much. I, I don't know. We could add extra attributes, whatever you want, but it, tagging that kind of stuff, unless it makes a difference for the search, shouldn't be in this table. If it's just an attribute of the link, then it shouldn't be in there, then it should just be in a regular database table. 
and then the link is in here with just the standard weight. So unless something matters for the searches, I think should a weight be more, uh, should the weight be more or less, that that would be relevant, then yeah, you don't want to put it in the graph table. Last question, I believe. Yeah, Hello, question. Mitch. Taken into consideration when. Uh, Can you repeat that because you're yes. trading in and out? How is weight taken into consideration when calculating uh, shortest path? Um, the low, from memory, the lowest weight wins. So it's 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 added up as you as you walk, and um, the path that has the least weight tends to win. So that's taken over the entire length of the of the track, which of course, if you have different weights, makes the, the story more complex. It's more difficult to actually track whether it's done the right thing or not. Yes, I think it is. And I think in some cases you don't want it to be a sum. Uh, I've already had that question. Um, you want to you want to make it into a product or something? Yeah. Um, doesn't do that at the moment. That would be a separate algorithm. But again, you can add an algorithm. You make you make number three, number four, number five, and you can make it do do that instead. There's no particular reason why the, the computation can't do that. Uh, by the way, the implementation of an algorithm, it's about 10 lines of code. The problem is that it's 10 lines of nasty C++ code. I'll happily, I think we're out of time, but I'll, I'll happily show you the source code and, and, um, and we can browse around in it and you can see what it looks like. Because it is, it is not visually complex, it's just a nuisance to work with. Okay? Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Ryan. And here is a macadamia nutshell bowl for you. Beautiful. From Thank you. LCA. Thank you very much. Thank you.